Hi, I'm Jesse Wente. I'm a husband and father, an Anishinaabe man from uh, Toronto. I'm also the co-executive director of the Indigenous Screen Office and chair of the Canada Council for the Arts. Jesse, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, I want to start by getting your macro perspective on Canada's arts economy. So in general, what is the state of the arts economy in Canada today? And how do you think our cultural capital is perceived by the rest of the world? I think there's a fairly significant recognition that Canada has a vibrant culture, particularly First Nations, Métis and Inuit culture is particularly sought after globally because it is, of course, unique to Canada. Uh, uh, and so I think that there's a, a certainly a growing appreciation and, and demand for that. And at the same time, I don't think Canada yet has totally fulfilled its potential globally in terms of as, as a place that has such rich diversity um, and with, with a lot of culture moving to a more global uh, sort of uh, dissemination, I think there's an opportunity for places like Canada where people still have such connections to their cultures, whether they are, uh, first to this place, to Turtle Island, or whether they're newcomers here, they he, this is a culture that can you can maintain those connections and in a way speak to those audiences even from here. And I think that is a very interesting place for Canada. So, so in a lot of ways, I think there's uh, an enormous opportunity to take a larger role culturally, uh, globally, even though we maybe have hit above our weight historically. Well, let, let's tap into how we can seize or, or build upon that opportunity. Um, from your perspective, looking at supports for the arts and supports for that uh, cultural ecosystem, um, what supports or policies do you think are needed to uplift uh, Canadian artists, uh, especially Indigenous ones, since you mentioned uh, rightfully so that that's something that's absolutely unique to Canada and therefore a big, big cultural advantage. So what are we needing in terms of support and policy? And how can that support ecosystem be improved so really we can end up punching way above our weight, way farther abroad? As you probably know, there was the Arts and Culture Summit in Ottawa in May. And, you know, I think a lot of the focus on stage was around those policy and legislative changes that the government is uh, seeking to, you know, pass uh, this uh, session what what was more interesting maybe to me was the discussions in the crowd audience or uh, among my peers uh, there among those that lead arts organizations and artists you know and there i think the policy change that everyone was seeking is actually one that extends well beyond the cultural sector which is to see um the advancement of some sort of more stable income support that the you know for so many artists their jobs are what what would we what now be characterized as gig workers uh you know they're 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 seasonal or they're they go up and down there isn't you're not necessarily working at a nine to five job when you're an artist and um when you have an event like the the pandemic that disrupts sort of the traditional economy, those folks are often the most vulnerable you know they don't have an employer that's looking to make sure they can support the work, you know, throughout this, or it's, it's very different. And so, you know, we heard a lot of conversations around um, ideas of like universal basic income or some sort of, some sort of guaranteed basic income. We just saw, I think it's Ireland introduced this specifically for artists. I tend to think that, you know, one of the challenges we face is that in Canada's arts and culture ecosystem, particularly its arts ecosystem, you know, we have one of public granting of, you know, the government is heavily involved in the, the in in the production or the 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 sector itself um that granting has increasingly over time become part of the social safety net in a way that it was not intended when those systems were initially set up so increasingly the grants the council gives um the iso may give meaning the indigenous screen office you know any any arts granting agency increasingly those are how artists sustain themselves and that's not really their intent. You know, their intent was to foster artistic practice, not necessarily keep the lights on uh, for the artist. Um, and so 
but I think that is also true of of people everywhere across the economy and across sectors that when your primary concern is simple survival, it is really hard to innovate, grow, to expand, to to uh, uh, experiment, to risk, to take risks, all of the sorts of things that I actually think propel not just the economy, but all sorts of systems and things forward in the world. And I think if we sort of reoriented ourselves to something where we ameliorated that risk on a wide frame basis for, for Canadians, where knowing what, how you're going to pay for the lights and your food and for your shelter, that those sorts of basic human needs are resolved because there just aren't. And that is a policy choice in Canada, right? That we don't resolve those things. It's not a question of wealth. This is a very, very wealthy place. It's a question of choosing how that wealth, where that wealth accumulates and how it's, how it's um, dispersed. You know, if we switched our policy choices and said, you know, I think we would rather people have those sorts of basic needs taken care of. I think you would see an explosion in innovation and output not just across the creative sectors, but across all sectors. And I also heard a need for a formal move past the Massey Commission, which really, you know, was the foundation for all of Canadian cultural infrastructure pretty much to this day. Uh, that commission and its work needs to be updated, just like the Broadcasting Act, that it's painfully out of date and we need to... Um, Think about Canadian culture and what it is to have Canadian cultural supports in the context of 2022, not 1950, uh, and that um, that would be a worthy endeavor, and I would agree with with that as well. Let's shift gears a bit. You've spoken about um, Indigenous uh, relations and, and Indigenous issues throughout. Um, in your book, Unreconciled, uh, you, you criticize or you call to account the concept of reconciliation. Um, so I want to ask, what is your take on economic reconciliation in Canada, if there is such a thing uh, in your in your view, and what must be done and by who uh, to really create yeah more economic access or equity uh, for Indigenous people in Canada? And if you want to add an art spin to this, please, by all means. When I was 10 years old, I got a brand new BMX bike. Uh, if you were a kid in the 80s, you knew this was an exciting moment in your life. Um, the first time I rode that bike out in the neighborhood, a neighborhood bully punched me out and took the bike. This is a true story. This actually happened. So I went home and I told my dad I was very upset because my dad asked me, where's the bike? And I said, oh, this punched me out and they took it. So my dad took me over to this kid's house. And I get this is where I asked the questions. What do you think my dad did? Do you think he said to the kids and his parents, just say you're sorry, keep the bike. But just say you're sorry and it's all good. Or do you think my dad said, give the bike back and then say you're sorry and then we can have the reconciliation? I, I'd ask any parent, what would they do? What is what what solution do they see in that? I have yet to hear the parent who said, oh, no, we let the uh, the kid who stole the bike, we let them keep it. And and we just said it's, they said we're sorry and it's all good. That is currently what, what re Canada frames reconciliation, is that it gets to keep the bike and just say it's sorry. And so the interim step is reparations, which is a phrase and a word used more, more often in the south of the medicine line than here in Canada. But reparations are in order, and maybe that's when we get to the discussion of land back and what that would actually look like. And then we're on the pathway towards what might be described as economic reconciliation. Until that until we're sort of having those discussions, I think any sort of modes for for equality of access um, are blunted by the fact that, you know, it's hard to get equality of access when you have been expressly excluded from those systems up until very recently, right? Like, what are we talking about? Like equality of access in 2022? What about the previous 150 years that my community was impoverished by? that that the rest of Canada was in was made wealthy by what about those 150 years is there no equality for that Canadian cultural industries because of the Massey Commission were expressly constructed to exclude Indigenous people right the Canada Council when it was founded in 1957 no Indigenous arts were eligible and if you wanted if you were an Indigenous person and you wanted to grant you had to be performing a European art form so um you know we we know there's a uh, the the connection is right there and so until you sort of disrupt that very notion 
those sorts of real uh, reconciliatory sort of things um, are going to be a challenge. Before there was Canada, there was no poverty here. There was no economic inequality. That's not how First Nations, at least the Anishinaabe, governed themselves. These are imported problems that are the result of the systems imposed on these lands. This is a country that it was illegal for Indigenous people to have a lawyer uh, until about 50 years ago. It was illegal for Indigenous people to gather in groups of more than seven uh, until 50 years ago. Indigenous people weren't allowed to vote in Canada until 1960. I don't, like, by which time um, all the major infrastructure, you know, in Canada was built. Like, a lot of the wealth was already pulled out before we were even allowed to vote as, as part of the democracy here. I think it's a bit pie in the sky to think about economic reconciliation. I think um, Canada would need to, to abruptly change course for that to even be a reality for my grandchildren. Let me ask one follow-up, and it's sort of a devil's advocate question. Yeah. I'm just putting it out there because um, it, I think it's important. You, you not characterized, but you said that Canada is co a corporation. It was, an incorp it was incorporated mm. as one. It was run as one. What a corporation cares about is profit or net benefit to itself. So if we are to change the narrative and the approach that Canada writ large has towards its relationship and its duties and its obligations or even or and its past crimes uh, towards indigenous people and their, their their communities. How do we get the corporation to see the benefit in doing that 180? How do we structure that beyond saying, and again, this is devil's advocate, beyond saying it's the right thing to do? I think it might behoove Canada to think of, well, couldn't we build an industry around giving those back, just like we built an industry around taking them away? Like, you know, it, it required concerted effort and enormous investment to ensure that I would not speak my language, right? Beyond the torturing of my grandmother in the schools, like tons of people were employed, like buildings were built. Like there was a whole Indian agency in Ottawa, like thousands of people have been engaged in this industry across the history of Canada. Why can't thousands be engaged in returning the language to my, to my community? Why can't thousands be engaged in returning the culture uh, to my community? If folks had come here with the idea of not dominion, but of, of partnership of, of kinship, the wealth would have been much more extraordinary than it has been. And you wouldn't have had to wage wars and done all this other stuff. That's incredibly costly in order to get it. I think there's a lot of fear that because Canadian prosperity came because of the oppression of Indigenous people, there's this feeling that its downfall will be, the that the reverse will be its downfall. In other words, when Indigenous people prosper, Canada will nosedive. That's just not real. And in fact, I think what I would position is how much healthier would Canada have been now if it had not done those things? How much healthier would Canada be 